Welcome to the Ideas Hour with your hosts, David Cameron and Suzanne Zedike, exploring big ideas that matter. This series was originally broadcast on Teacher Hub Radio in 2021 and 2022. It is still available in their archive as well as in this format. Introducing today's conversation is an absolute treat for me. I love the bringing together of ideas and one of my cliches used to be that the real action and progress lay in the hyphens. Neuroscience, astrophysics, the areas where different ideas and disciplines come together and explode. I'm obsessed with the same phenomenon in music and I could absolutely bore you rigid with examples of that before the copyright police arrived and clamped down on my playlist. But you're not going to be bored today because we're going to be hearing about psychology, about history, about development, about ecology and about evolution and more from someone whom I've come to think of as a genuine polymath. Because today we are welcoming Darsha Narvaez. Is coming to us from the USA. She's done immensely important work in thinking about the needs of babies for healthy development. And she is now particularly well known for her concept of the evolved nest and its relation to the emergence of moral capacities in human beings. Darsha is based at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, where she holds the post of Professor Emerita of psychology. She's the author of at least a dozen books, one of which many of my followers will have been featured in my many presentations. And that's her 2014 book entitled Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality. And in 2017, that book won the Expanded Reason Award, which I love and is reason enough to have her come be on our show. But I wanted to add that in 2020, an analysis of top scientists in the world was conducted, and Darsha emerged in the top 2% of that analysis, based in part on the number of citations that her work has received. So, Darsha, it is an absolute delight to welcome you to the Ideas Hour. Thanks so much for having me. It's uh, marvelous to be with you and to share our ideas uh, across the pond. (laughs) So to speak. They certainly have international implications, you know, global implications. So let's jump right in. Darsha, do you want to summarize the central thesis of your work? What's the key idea that you would want listeners to take away? Well, I have a bunch of big ideas. Let's see if I can boil it down. Uh, The capitalistic, industrialized, technocratic societies that we are all now living in Uh, have really forgotten the wellness-informed pathway to growing a human being. Thriving human beings are those who display cooperation and generosity, flexibility, autonomy, ecological attachment, and an earth-based wisdom. This is what we see in our ancestors, in sustainable societies. And our evolved nature, our human nature, comes from the provision of the evolved nest, which my lab has identified based on interdisciplinary research. And it's really important, this nest, uh, in early life when the brain is rapidly growing and developing, but we also need to be nested throughout our lives uh, to maintain our sociality and our well-being. But the forgetting of the, the wellness-informed pathway is most evident in the United States one of probably the worst places to raise a baby. We have a lot of traumatized, dysregulated adults here who raise children in ways that were similar to their own experiences. And I call the lack of the nest undercare. It causes multiple micro traumas throughout childhood and just shifts people away from their evolved human nature of cooperation. And what we, uh, what's good now is that people are recognizing the need for trauma-informed practice. That's great, but that only gets you back to like zero. And we're not really, uh, and now we need to attend to the wellness-informed practice, which gets you to 100%, which is about 
you know, fulfilling each unique person's potential. That's such a, a rich answer, Dasha. And um, I, have to, I have to put my hands up at this point, which the listeners won't be able to see. And just confess, I'm totally outgunned in this conversation. I'm out degreed, I'm out professor, and I've never been an emeritus anything. So I love your concept of the evolved nest, and I know it. I know it's one that you're you're well known for. Um, but can you tease it out a bit, just just for me? Of course. Uh, the baselines for what we think is normal or typical for our human species have really slipped at, over the last, uh, especially the last decades, but even before that 100 years, 500 years, millennia. <laughs> and we've been uh, kind of taught to think to only look back to the last 6,000 years or so for baselines for anything. But we've been around for 2 million years, more than that, depending on how you count the, the species. And uh, we've evolved um, originally in connected cooperative communities, not these disconnected, competitive, and now destructive communities of today. Now, there are more humans on the planet, but that doesn't mean we're successful, doesn't mean we're better uh, specimens than our ancestors. We're actually quite unintelligent in comparison um, because we've undermined the evolved nest. So I'm bringing it all back to the undermining of the evolved nest over the last millennia and we've squelched all sorts of capacities that we really need to live well as earth creatures. And so the nest uh, involves soothing perinatal experiences, soothing gestation and birth, uh, breastfeeding for several years, soothing uh, responsive relationships, a positive climate, uh, welcoming climate, the baby feels uh, like they belong, like they have a positive impact, that they're always integrated into the life of the community positive touch, uh, moving touch. Babies need to be moved a lot to help digestion and brain growth. And uh, they need no negative touch, uh, which is has long-term effects on everyone. So no spanking, no pinching, no slapping. And then there's self-directed play with multiple uh, aged playmates, preferably in the natural world. So you're getting a lot of different experiences all the time, building the brain, children's Childhood should be filled with play in this self-directed way, social play. Then allo parents, uh, lest everyone think, oh no, this is all lying on mother's backs again. No, blame the moms. No, this is a community effort. The, the evolved nest, except for birth and perhaps breastfeeding, everything else is shared and, and offered by the community. And then there is a, a, key, a nature connection, and that's really important to have embedded, immersed experience in the natural world so that uh, you actually build the relationships with all the, the sentience of the, of the planet. And lastly, we've identified also healing practices because humans make choices. We often can make mistakes and we overlook things and we get unbalanced. We need healing practices to restore our relational uh, connections, to restore our out of balanceness, um, mentally, physically, etc. So that's the evolved nest. <laughs> I'm already, I'm already eight minutes in, Dasha, and deeply regretting we've only got an hour. Um, you just covered so much ground in that, and what you won't know is that cutting across a whole number of the conversations that we're having, these same themes have been coming up. Um, in relation to a conversation around Darwin and psychology, in relation to a conversation we've been having uh, ab about terrorism and the links to violence and, and that huge importance of community and cooperation and a different understanding of evolution has become a, an interesting theme through a number of these ideas. Ours. And it seems to me that that idea matters more than ever right now. And, you know, clearly from your comments, that's something you would agree with. But can you articulate for us why you think that matters so much right now, Darsha? Yes, this is really critical. Uh, people say, oh, we've been doing fine for decades. Why, why do we have to change our behavior now? And aren't we successful? We can talk more about what that means later. We've actually reached what's called the four horsemen of the environmental apocalypse, E.O. Wilson's term. Uh, they identif he identified decades ago. So 
This is uh, massive toxification of soil, water, and air, degradation of the atmosphere, widespread extinction of species, and the global warming or global burning or global weirding or climate instability, however you want to talk about it. So those four things uh, are, are critical and they have sub uh, aspects. So the disappearance of insects uh, all over the world, that is, it, once the insects are gone, we're gone, right? Uh, so we need to understand that we're on the brink of extinction and I, I, again, point to the lack of the evolved nest and then the cultures that emerge from people who are unnested. What happens with unnestedness is you get very self-centered because you didn't get what you needed. Your survival systems get enhanced and, and you only look for, well, you notice threat everywhere. And then you look for safety. And usually that's either being dominant or just withdrawing, kind of hiding away, not being yourself. You don't develop your heart sense. You develop your the link between your gut and your, um, your intellect. But other societies have lived uh, for tens of thousands of years. The San Bushmen of, the, of Southern Africa are, uh, we have genes from them. Our, all, the, all humans on the planet apparently have genes that come from them and they've been around for 150,000 years at least. They live sustainably, they provide the nest, they look happy and healthy and they, they're just, in this connected uh, cooperative society that gives us the vision for how uh, humans evolved, how they adapted, how they uh, live well on the earth. And if we don't get back to that, <clears throat> we're really not gonna last. Thank you. D Darsha, there are so many ideas in there that I'm sure both of us would like to come back and pick up on, but can I focus this just for a moment most of our audience are teachers, educators, schools. So how do you think your ideas are most relevant for that group of people? Yes, I used to be a classroom teacher and I'm in my eighth career now. So uh, I did spend some time in the classroom as a um, music teacher of all ages and also as a Spanish teacher in middle school, as well as had my own business teaching adults. So. I come from a family of educators. And uh, so I always have this practical ideas in the back of my mind. What do we do now? What do we do on Monday morning? You know, kind of thing. Um, so I think all teachers now, educators need to understand anybody who works with kids, even with adults, to be trauma informed actually is to understand that your clients, your students uh, probably are coming in with some kind of trauma, traumatic experience. And because of that, they will not have developed their fullest social and emotional intelligences. Uh, and so they're gonna need help with that because uh, the Evolved Nest provides for the help that's needed to support those intelligences. And few kids are actually experiencing the Evolved Nest anymore. And there be uh, children then who have not developed their self-regulatory capacities to their fullest either. And we can see this, you know, they'll be too aggressive or too with, withdrawn and just um, go into panic states and such. These are all self-regulation issues and self-regulation involves uh, emotion systems, endocrine systems, immune systems, all sorts of physiological systems, but also the social, social and um, getting along capacities. So children will need to learn to uh, self-regulate with belly breathing and other uh, activities in the classroom. I used to use uh, visualization and calming, um, relaxation, uh, integrating that with Spanish in Spanish when I was teaching Spanish. Um, so there are other things too. We can come back to those, Darsha, but it gives us a sense of, uh, it gives our listeners a sense of how this might apply to them, even if they don't work with babies. Okay, Darsha, you've offered us tons of interesting ideas. Can I come back to something that you said, that I wrote down? You said, the USA is one of the worst places to raise a baby at the moment. Did you really mean that? Or is that an overstatement? I actually do mean that. And I do speak rather bluntly about things, as you know, uh, because 
uh, people seem to be kind of uh, numbed out and dissociated, distracted by other things, right? And they don't realize what's going on right now. So children, babies especially need our attention, our full hearted presence right now to grow well. And if, you know, I, people say, oh, well, you know, it's the parent's responsibility. Oh, uh, they have to work harder and then their, their kids will be fine. No, the babies need help right now. Uh, and in the United States, parents get very little help uh, raising children. They have to, we have medicalized birth uh, that traumatizes mother and baby for the long term uh, in, in so many ways. And then the mothers often feel like they have to go back to work within a week or two of having the baby. And the baby gets shipped off to a stranger day, daycare that's shifting, that's, uh, you know, Parents can't afford to pay, have a be involved in a care system that where people are well educated with college degrees and know how to deal with children and have enough staff. I mean, we have hardly any good daycare, maybe five percent of all options for child care centers uh, are really adequate. And the for babies, they're pretty much inadequate. You need to have a, like a four adults to one child ratio. So anyway, in the US, uh, parents don't get enough support. Uh, healthcare is very scattered and iffy around here as well. And the, the uh, culture emphasizes toughness rather than tenderness. That's a, a longstanding issue. There's almost a taboo on being too tender and, and the belief that babies, oh, they're too needy. You know, they shouldn't be bothering their parents so much. Uh, how do we, you know, so there's this minimize the needs of young children uh, so that adults can go back to work, essentially. So it's just, uh, I think, a rather uh, horror scape for being a baby. So if we hear that statement about America, and I love that you have spoken so bluntly, it, it then helps people to think, okay, so how do I think we compare to America in my country or my region or my community? And for many people, it feels striking to think that baby care is so important to a community. So David, could I just pull you in there? Because of the three of us, you're not the baby expert of the, of the three of us. Do, do you want to come in there partly by just, what does that sound like to people who don't work with babies to hear that kind of statement? What do you think? Well, I think we all work with people who wear babies. Um, and some pretty recently. Um, so I think that idea of understanding, it's a, it's a theme that's come up, Dasha, in a lot of these conversations, how important it is to understand the child, to understand the learner. And I think without that awareness of experience, there, there's a really interesting uh, coming together today, the day we're recording this, because it's just been revealed that the government, the Westminster government has has been underfunding uh, early years provision now for some time. And I think that gives a real clear amplification to how much that period, that earliest period is really disregarded politically. And it would be useful, I think, for you to further develop why you think this period of infancy is, is just so significant. Yes, uh, babies, I argue, are quite different from children. We know uh, that childhood adverse experiences, uh, we call that ACEs in the States, adverse childhood experiences, are uh, fundamentally related to well-being, health, physical, mental, even early death, if you have too many of these adversities. But the, the list of adversities that are, that are measured are childhood adversities. They're not babyhood adversities that I was uh, hinting at earlier, babyhood adversities then are all these things that go wrong or are traumatizing in birth, even uh, stressful pregnancy is going to negatively impact that baby. And uh, just not having the nest provision is traumatizing to a child. Uh, so in the first three years, especially babies need to be treated very kindly as their brain is developing so rapidly, thousands of synapses of brain connections every second are going on. And you don't know what, every baby is different. You don't know exactly what's being 
scheduled to develop at any given moment. So the nest provides the buffer for what is uh, the support needed for optimal development, keeping the biochemistry of that baby in a positive state uh, with the oxytocin flowing, for example, the cuddle hormone, rather than cortisol, the mobilizing stress hormone that can then actually shut down growth. So you don't want that to happen. You don't want to distress the baby because in those early years, the child is not only establishing how well the systems are going to work, function, what their thresholds are, for example, the stress response. If the baby's stressed a lot in early life, the stress response will be easily activated throughout life. As a result of that, they'll see threat everywhere, and that shuts down the brain uh, higher order thinking because the blood flow goes to fight, flight, freeze, faint, you know, and, and you can't um, think very well in those states. And we have a lot in our country, the USA, I think we have a lot of adults now who go into fight, flight very quickly. They go into the anger, the fear, the panic modes, and then they just want to latch onto something uh, to make them feel safer. And, and uh, because they haven't had great uh, childhood experiences, they latch on to an ideology, something someone else told them. Green people are scary, so be careful of those people. They're dangerous. <gasps> There's a green person. Bonk! You're into that fight flight mode. And it's crazy. That's not real. Uh, but it's, you know, you get off of these illusions and fantasies, and you can see it all over the states now. So babyhood really matters because it sets up your worldview. Is the world a safe place? Am I a good person? Is our uh, relationships reliable? All those things are being uh, decided in the nonverbal years for that child. And they're so hard to change because they're just in the basic associative mind. And then the way what's been conditioned up or down to be safe or to be scared. So Darsha, one of the things that does is it helps people to think more about some of the political shifts that we have seen in America in Britain and in many other countries, uh, back toward an authoritarian shift in so many places, that's coming out of scared populations is what you're saying. That's right. Yes, so that's the, the long-term effects are what you see. The, so when you're under cared for in early childhood, your brain is shaped then to be uh, enhance those survival systems you're born with. When you're well cared for in the evolved nest, you grow all the social, the social emotional intelligence, how to get along and all the little nuances of starting and stopping conversations uh, non-verbally. All these things happen in the first six months of life. You learn the basic micro skills of being a social creature. Those things get missed. You're, you're missing that, those skills of connection. Uh, if you've been undercared for or they're very spotty, and then you go to school and you're told to forget your, what, what your emotions are telling you, what your intuition is telling you, the, to watch the bird outside the window. Oh, no, no, pay attention here to this information, take the test, uh, stay in the intellect, stay in your thinking mind. That's what's really important. So the Western world has emphasized that to the degree of undermining the heart sense, the heart mindedness that every, virtually every other society in the world thinks is the core of being a human being. And so here we are in the States, you can see it. People have these gut reactions, which are survival systems oriented. And then they're taught in school to hang out in this intellect and they're missing the real heart uh, space of being a human being. So they flip between these states and you get all this craziness of uh, wanting to dominate other people because that's the gut, the survival system, or, uh, you know, punish them, be cruel, a lot of cruelty going on as well. And now it's, it's authoritarianism. You're attracted to those things. You're attracted to the stories where you feel more important and safer, you know, and putting other people down to be safe is so embedded in the USA with racism and classism and sexism. It's so imbued in every, uh, every institution, unfortunately. So we have a lot of work to do to heal ourselves. And we can move in at any level, the early care, childhood, adulthood, and then the stories we tell each other. So we've gotten into dominant stories, you know, that we're the best, you know, the, 
a city on a hill, the shining beacon of the world. That's what Americans have been told over and over. Uh, despite the fact that the uh, expansive racism and, <clears throat> and cruelty in its history. One of the things that I love that you do that helps people to think is that you give things name. Because when a thing has a name, it's a thing. You've invented this idea called undercare. And I know you've touched on it, but I think that's shocking for a lot of people to hear. So what is undercare? Well, you have to understand what a child expects and needs as a social mammal. We are social mammals uh, in our kind of child raising. Social mammals have a particular nest and the, our evolved nest is very similar to the generic kind of social mammal nest. It emerged 75 million years ago and it stayed pretty much the same all the way through with you know, species specific uh, differences. <clears throat> and that, that nest, is set up to match the maturational schedule of the young, whichever species it is. And that nest then is constant, pretty much 24 seven touch carrying uh, for human beings, carrying babies around. So when you don't carry the baby, when you isolate the baby in a carrier, a crib, a, a pram, stroller, uh, you are inducing stress. <clears throat> That's a micro trauma. And this is a problem for uh, car seats and all right now. So, uh, or when you leave the baby to cry, you leave them alone at all. You put them in another room, uh, you are inducing trauma. Uh, now, uh, it's, I call it undercare because neglect is a legal term and cannot, you can't use that term. Uh, so undercare means that you're not providing nest components. You're not giving them positive attention constantly. The babies, again, this is babies. Once they become older, they need lots of independence. But when they're babies, you really need to be a helicopter parent of keeping them calm, right? And when you don't, when you let them, when you let them get uh, upset and uh, isolated, you are then uh, creating, a, you're shifting their trajectory for ill health and ill being. Dasha, it's been so reassuring um, to listen to you because you've got so many overlaps with Suzanne's work um, and, and I think you've you've recognised that between the two of you. You've also overlapped, as I said, with other conversations, your importance around babyhood absolutely echoes the conversation we had with, with Ben Bradley as part of this series. But I think it would be helpful um, for, for other listeners too, to, to hear a wee bit more about some of the other links that you've got to other educationalists, to other scientists, to other thinkers, because we don't just want to talk about big ideas. What we want to do is interconnect ideas and get people to take that breadth of view that you're so adept at putting across. So some links and some connections. All right. Yes. Well, I, I read widely, so there's a lot of people to, to, to consider. I'll just mention a few. Uh, to understand our ev evolutionary history as social mammals, I've relied on Jak Panksept, a world-renowned neuroscientist, unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Uh, for the evolved nest idea, uh, coming from anthropology primarily, archeology span as well, uh, the anthropologists I rely on are Sarah Hurdy, Melvin Connor, Barry Hewlett, Michael Lamb, and psychobiologist James Prescott. James Prescott uh, noted decades ago that looking at the um, case studies of um, societies around the world, over 400 of them that anthropologists have collected, that peaceful societies are ones that carry their babies uh, pretty much 24 seven and breastfeed for at least, at least two and a half years. Uh, that's a, time point when the brain shifts uh, from growth to repair around two and a half years. And uh, so that was quite rev revelatory. Oh my goodness. Uh, for other interpersonal neurobiology uh, information and studies and uh, integration, I look to Alan Shore, Dan Siegel, Dan Stern, who've written beautifully about early experience, the mother-child 
uh, attachment systems and, and what it looks like for a baby to grow uh, their sociality well. For biosocial functioning, I look to others, uh, a, a kind of a interdisciplinary group, Tim Ingle, the anthropologist, Stephen Porges, Mabel Tone, Sue Carter. Uh, and then for the indigenous worldview, which I came to more recently, I also looked to Tim Ingle, but also many anthropologists like uh, uh, Richard Lee, and then Native Americans, Four Arrows, Vine Deloria, Melissa Nelson, Greg Cajete, Robin Wall Kimmerer. And for culture effects over time, I look to Marvin Bram, the historian, Ian McGilchrist, Morris Berman, among others. I mean, there's many others. These are ones that pop into my mind uh, because I've thought about them more recently. Darsha, what it shows is that, it's your point really, David, it shows that there are lots of people trying to think about these ideas, but they don't always, those insights don't always make it into the wider culture and to the wider uh, pop, populace so that we can talk about them, which is, I guess, the motivation behind this show, the Ideas Hour, is to give people a chance to take part in in big ideas that are important to their future. I mean, I, mean, I think a, a really good example of the kind of thing that you would like to see happening, Suzanne, is Sapiens. And, and I think there's a lot in Sapiens about that, the idea of when was the, the, the golden time, if you like, that overlaps so much with your work, Darsha. So it, it, it is interesting how some ideas get traction and some working out of ideas get traction. But I'm obsessed, obviously, um, with, with climate. I'm obsessed with our relationship with the natural world. Um, and, and I really wanted just to, to take us back into that. Um, you, you mentioned Ian McGiltris' book, uh, or you mentioned Ian McGiltris and his book, The Master and His Emissary, is one that Susanna and I have featured in other discussions. And we used the film The Divided Brain. And, and your idea of the environmental apocalypse comes very close to that. And what I wanted to ask was what other steps do we need to make to achieve that real cultural shift that you're seeking? And I suppose my second question is, can we do that quickly enough to meet the climate emergency? Yes, so I think the steps, I can divide them into adults and children. For adults, I think what we need is to readopt the indigenous worldview, which is one of two worldviews, according to Robert Redfield, the social anthropologist, there's the, the one world view where you consider the cosmos to be amoral, fragmented, unenchanted, uh, which is the dominant world view since the 17th century uh, Europe, um, which has now been pushed around the world through capitalism and industrialization and such. Uh, and that world view then you know, treats the natural world as if it's dead and dumb uh, that as if humans are superior and should be controlling and dominating and extracting. Uh, whereas the indigenous worldview is one that sees the cosmos as moral, as enchanted, as connected, and that uh, we are one with the natural world, not separate, not superior, and that we have responsibilities to keep it flourishing. And this worldview then is uh, evident in all the First Nations of the world, uh, the ones who haven't been traumatized or genocidally treated. Uh, and it's, uh, it leads to sustainability, durable societies that live respectfully with the natural world. They, they adapt to the local landscape instead of imposing their abstract ideals on the landscape, right? And making a green lawn, for example, monoculture. <laughs> Uh, that doesn't feed any insects or anything. It's kind of dead. Uh, again, this is a very left brain dominated perspective because the left brain loves dead things and static and categorizations, right? And the right hemisphere is all about living and, and connection and relationships. So anyway, to get back to the indigenous worldview, we need to have in a sense of ecological attachment. We, we, divide, we had an experiment that was published last year where we uh, had um, undergraduates for three weeks practice 
a daily practice for ecological attachment. And then we tested pre and post whether that helped. Think about, observe the clouds today. Uh, acknowledge the trees you walk by today. Things like that where you actually ground yourself on the earth in relationship. Uh, and it did work. It increased their ecological empathy after three weeks. Um, we have now those kinds of practices at a website called ecoattachment.dance. Uh, and you can get that from evolvenest.org. So just getting back on the earth and not out of your ivory tower thinking head, right? Back to being in your body, earthing, sunning, uh, hugging trees, whatever it is that gets you connected back into relationship. We have to heal our trauma also to get back to the true self, to uncover the... <clears throat> all the wounds, uh, the primal wounds to start to heal them so we can get back to our heart-centered way of being. Growing the right hemisphere is the way to do this. You can do that throughout life. The right brain actually grows more rapidly in early life. So, and that's when you don't have the nest, it, it gets undermined, doesn't grow as, as well. And so you end up with less connection, less self-control, less empathy, less sense of higher consciousness. But adults and kids can regrow it through play. I advocate play, self-directed social play, running around playing chase or tag and wrestling and being creatively interactive through play is a way to grow that right hemisphere. Whatever makes you stay in the present moment because and, and interrelate uh, helps grow that right hemisphere. Building your sense of the present moment also, which is part of our heritage to be so fully full of the present moment in your relationships, everything's alive, having a sense of the ancestors of a spiritual uh, realm, that is gonna help everyone get back to realization that this place is alive, I'm alive, I'm connected. For children too, similar kinds of um, activities, following the inner compass of babies, they know what they need, just follow it, uh, keep them calm, uh, content, and, uh, once they are ready to move away and, and be independent, let them be that way. Children are ready to do their own thing after a few years, and that they'll be ready for independence if you've nurtured them well with the evolved nest in babyhood. And they should be uh, introduced to the natural world as much as possible, as soon as possible, as wild as possible, letting babies just lie there on the grass, sit there and watch. They'll have all sorts of senses activated that we have now uh, diminished or suppressed in children, let them have their freedom with the natural world. And they, and children want to fit in, they want to be cooperative. So follow their impulses for that. Two-year-olds are notoriously uh, oriented to, you know, doing all sorts of things and don't have much empathy for anyone yet. Let them uh, trust, test themselves. Don't punish them uh, because then you're going to undermine their motivation. Uh, potentially. So uh, follow the children's impulses. And when you do that from the beginning, you're going to have a very cooperative, connected child. I mean, this is music to my ears. I'm a trustee or was a trustee of an organization in the UK called Learning Through Landscapes. And I'm sure any colleagues from that organization would be delighted to hear what you've had to say, Darsha. The, the other thing just to mention, um, I'd recommend people have a look at Elizabeth Colbert's book, Under a White Sky, because what she does really well in that book is look at, if you like, the, the, the bigger solutions to climate change, the kind of cultural changes that you're talking about. But she looks at the steps that we might need to take in the short term because we've done so much damage um, that we need halting and remedial actions as well as that kind of fundamental change. So um, just that we throw away Elizabeth Colbert, Under a White Sky, well worth a look at. Um, Suzanne, I'm sure you're going to take us back in a different direction. I just find myself thinking about how we get people to be more curious about what are essentially scary ideas. So I loved Darsha that you said just a little bit ago, about trams and strollers and car seats. Some of my followers will know that in 2008, I published a study about the impact of strollers on interactions between parents and babies. And it was at that point, the first 
time any such research had ever been done, and I think to this day still is. And I tell that story because it got lots and lots of media coverage, but most of it was to laugh at me. And I'm quite happy to say I was really, I went home and hid for quite a few days because I didn't know what to do with the media's making fun of what I thought was a quite important idea. And yet you are saying the same thing. You're saying that some of the really standard ways that we raise babies could be traumatizing. Can I just, is that right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Every day. What I've noticed in the United States is that people really don't want to talk about babies. They often don't want to talk about parenting either. And I think it's because people are so traumatized themselves that they've, they've put a, a wall around that aspect of themselves and had to harden their hearts. And they're encouraged by culture to harden their hearts and, you know, don't spoil the baby. And uh, you should have, I I call it grit for babies, right? You're going to make you have grit, baby, make you independent. And uh, all these mythological stories are uh, um, kind of a hideaway (laughs) for the parents' own trauma that they've experienced. So I think um, it's really hard uh, for people to realize how important that is without having some sense of pain of their own loss, that they themselves were not treated that way. Often when I discuss, you know, the importance of breastfeeding or not spanking, people will write and say, oh, well, I, I'm, I was spanked and I'm fine. You know, and I, okay, give, <laughs> let me give you a, <laughs> an assessment of your mental health, your physical health and et cetera. Of course, they don't, they think that's normal because the baselines have shifted so much for what we think is a normal uh human being, you know, that, oh, it's normal to have depression. It's normal to be anxious. It's it's normal to be, uh, you know, have health concerns and be on prescription drugs. It's normal, normal. All that is shifted. That isn't normal. We should be healthy. We should be happy. We should be uh, not afflicted, but we're all afflicted now. And the baselines for what we think is, you know, typical have then shifted down that way. And so I think that's also contributing to this resistance to uh, noticing what babies need and to have a tenderness in the heart towards them rather than a hard heartedness um, because the culture tells you to do that and uh, they're going to dominate you and uh, you have to, you know, break their spirit or you'll uh, ruin the, ruin the child for life. If you don't break their spirit when they're young, that's Nazi child rearing manuals. We're advocating that. It's also longstanding in Europe um, that was brought to the States. I'm sorry to say, Uh, all the cruel treatment of people and children, tying them up like dogs, uh, so on. Uh, Lloyd DeMaus writes about this quite a bit, the history of child abuse. So anyway, I don't know, I could go on and on. (laughs) It it is wonderful to get this overlap, Darsha, with, with the work that Suzanne's been doing around early years and wonderful to get so many links into so many areas of of policy, areas where we've got campaigns moving. Um, But mindful of our kind of core audience, uh, maybe a a first question in terms of the big decisions, in terms of policy in education, what advice would you be giving? And, And I suppose it's difficult, you're in an American context and education systems are different. But but where do we need to go in terms of educational policy, first of all, and then we'll come back to the role of the teacher? I think the approach to recognizing trauma is the first step, uh, to have trauma-informed practice, to realize that people are coming in with wounds, and to be sensitive to that, then also to promote healing in various ways. So uh, for a Um, an institution that's going to affect all policies and practices and uh, staffing and so on, as well as the treatment of students or clients. But I think that's not enough now. If we really want to move in a direction that's going to save the species, essentially, uh, 
we need wellness informed practices as well. So people need to understand that the Evolve Nest is something all of us need. So it meets basic needs for uh, belonging, for autonomy, for competence building, for um, trust, building trust. We all need to have these practices. So start with the babies. They especially need it while their brain is uh, shaping itself, self-organizing around experience. But the older children, the adolescents, the adults also need to feel like they are part of the community, they belong, they're uh, welcomed, <clears throat> they have mentoring relationships, they have healing practices, they have nature connection built in to the way the world uh, of work works. Babies should be going to work with their parents. Um, it should make breastfeeding easy. It should make um, uh, the the institutions of the society should make all of this, uh, I guess they should all centralize around the well-being of families and kids. Right now, it's all about money in the States. It's all about following the job, the career, breaking up extended families. The rules about single family households, only one generation can be in a household with kids maybe, <clears throat> rather than extended families. All that needs to change. We need to support extended family, um, well-being and uh, make sure the workplaces know what the nest is and support it. And I think that's a, a wonderfully holistic view, Dasha, and, and a wonderfully holistic prescription, if you like. Um, maybe just to, to try and bring it down to what we would like to see from teachers, from nursery nurses, from classroom assistants, what would you like to see from those individuals working within the system to try and help and, and support the kind of changes that, as you say, we so desperately need? Well, I had mentioned earlier the importance of um, realizing that children need a lot of help building their skills that were not built in early babyhood, in particular early childhood. Uh, they may need help learn to learn to trust others if they were left alone a lot and left to cry, they will be more distrustful and that will take some time. So the teachers need to establish a secure attachment with each child, uh, or at least one of the staff members uh, for each child. And that uh, will vary by um, how fast that goes and how, how to do it, depending on the child's needs. They'll also, the child will also need to learn how to get along with the others in the classroom, how to be uh, cooperative, perhaps. Boys, and always remember that boys uh, mature more slowly, have uh, more developmental needs than girls. And so to expect them to need more of the nest for longer, more play, more cuddling, uh, because they have less built-in resilience as well. So to treat built boys with some sensitivity uh, and to then help, they, they tend to not reach the egalitarianism until a little later. Uh, and so to help them through that. And all of us need to really expand our imaginations about what's possible, what uh, thriving people, thriving children, thriving adults look like, uh, and how that involves our close connection with the natural world around us, that we care for the well-being of the trees we live with, the river, the, the mountain, the um, plants, and the animals around us are part of our responsibility in the web of life. So to always have that in mind, it's not enough uh, to be anthropocentric, to just focus on human relationships and human well-being. We need to expand and always take into account uh, insects and, and so on. I've uh, persuaded my husband to mow the, our lawn less because every time you mow the lawn, you're killing thousands of insects. And I see the insects flying around there. And if he has to mow the lawn, then I'll go out and I'll talk to him and I'll say, hey, go hide now <laughs> because the lawnmower is coming. <laughs> so Darsha, one of the things that does is it means that what you're saying matters to the people who mow the edge of the highways, you know, the edge of motorways. So what you are talking about as we wind up has relevance, not just for the people who spend time with babies and make policies for babies. It matters for every single one of us who are human beings on this earth. 
which is why we wanted to have you on to talk about big idea. Yes, absolutely. It's for all of us to change, to transform ourselves back to being earth centered uh, rather than some other detached uh, way of being. I think a lot of our culture has, has uh, evolved to be such that it could be on the moon, we could be in the moon or on Mars because we're not paying attention to the, the thriving of the earth, of the planet. And we need to return to that. And there are going to be so many people, Darsha, who will go away uh, from this program with their strengths and commitments renewed. There's a lot of discussion around schools about mindfulness, a lot of interest in well-being, a lot of that you've captured. And I think it's wonderful. I'm, I'm perfectly sure there'll be lots of people will be overwhelmed by your view and the astonishingly holistic and pantheistic nature of everything that you say. But um, you've given us a a really, really powerful and wonderfully brief message today, which is the lawnmower is coming. <laughs> and that, that for me absolutely <laughs> sums up where we are today. We now not only have the four horsemen of the environmental apocalypse, but we've got the lawnmower approaching. And the more we can do to prepare for that, to protect diversity, to protect thinking, to keep thinking of ourselves, not only as, as part of a race, part of a society, but also part of a much, much wider world. That's just been an absolutely brilliant reminder. And thank you so very much for that. So much. Thank you, Darsha. Thank you so much for having me. Wow, uh, we've done it. We've completed the first series of the ideas of Suzanne. My, my feeling is programs have been diverse and fascinating. What is it that you think has linked them all together? And what's your big takeaway from the whole series? David, do you know, I was reflecting on that when we interviewed the last of our guests. And for me, the thing that ties them together is how easily we overlook the power of relationships. For me, every single guest has highlighted something about the importance of relationships and how we need to care for one another. And I think we take that for granted. So Darsha talked about caring for babies. Ben talked about even Darwin's idea about agency and our abilities to relate to one another. Uh, the Witches of Scotland talked about how we discredited people's place in society in ways that really excluded them. Joan talked about terrorism and how that is embedded in the way we care for children in the very early years of our life. Those are just, for me, a few examples of the way in which our series has really picked up on the importance of relationships. And I love that that has been woven through every single one of our guests. I think that's brilliant as well, because in a sense, the driving force behind Teacher Hug Radio has been to highlight the importance of relationships and the importance of trying to take a different attitude towards children and young people. So I think it's good that we've reinforced that wider message as well. And what's surprising, of course, is we hadn't planned that, but it's just what has come through the series. So, in fact, if I countered with a question for you, what do you think teachers can take away from this whole series that might be lasting for them? I think you've really begun to highlight that. Um, I, th I think the importance of relationships is huge. And I think that's been underscored. And that's a framework, I think, for listeners to think about their practice with young people. And it gives them a different prism if, to think about how they relate to young people. I think one of the other things that's done for me is to highlight the importance of early years and the early start and how vital it is that we give young people that chance to feel safe, to feel secure, and yet to have that opportunity to explore and move more widely. I think the whole series has highlighted the importance of schools in terms of promoting ideas. I worry enormously, as you know, that we have lots of access to opinions, but much less access to information, knowledge, and ideas. 
and I think we've underscored the importance of that for teachers. I really hope that one of the things this series will do is to really spark curiosity because it's curiosity that keeps us from creating divisions and that helps us to step into uncomfortable ideas. And you and I really wanted that to come from the series. And I, I hope that that's part of what listeners and especially teachers have taken away. Yeah, I love that, that um, sometimes the questions are far more important than the answers. And sometimes the answers people are offered particularly in a world of populism, are shallow and manipulative. I think what we've tried to do is bring challenging ideas that make people think, and that is what I hope we've achieved through the series. Well, then, sounds like we gave it exactly the right title when we called it The Ideas Hour. And do you reckon, having done the first series, does it look like we might do a second one? What do you think? Only if anyone's listening, Suzanne. <laughs> Let's put our fingers together. Let's cross them and hope that we've got an audience. We've got an audience. We'll do the show. <laughs> it's been lovely to do this. Thank you to everyone who is listening. And we'll see you at the next one if, if the fingers are crossed right, David. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. And bye for now. Bye-bye. This has been the Ideas Hour brought to you by Suzanne Zedike and the real David Cameron.